Um, Anthony Carvey has been attending Golden Gate Breakfast Ooh. Club events since he was a child. And that probably makes it longer than many of our current members. Uh, he's now uh, an anesthesiologist and a biomedical engineer. He has uh, studied at uh, UC Berkeley and then uh, at Stanford and Harvard Medical School. And he's currently a fellow at uh, the Andrew Weil Center for Integrated Medicine at the University of Arizona. That's one of his accolades. His passion for people to discover their natural innate healing potentials from their, their environment, uh, their nutrition, their sleep, all of these which provide opportunities for, for health and happiness. Our, uh, our current crisis, which he will address, the COVID-19, is stressing our environment. And misinformation and panic are exacerbating that uh, stress. So what we're going to try to do today to maximize our time is Dr. Kave will briefly provide key information about the virus and our current, current medical knowledge. The remainder of the time would be to answer your questions, uh, such as how to care for high-risk individuals, uh, the effect of the emotional and psychological stresses that are occurring in the community, particularly with our young children. And uh, maybe you can even tell us how you uh, how you live with a person who has a high risk occupation, like a, uh, an emergency room physician. Um, Dr. Kave will also offer his perspective on uh, strategies to return to normalcy, to protect both our healthcare system and our economy. And I can tell you that uh, he is as anxious to return to what used to be normal as we are, according to his dad, Heavy, Hetty, uh, all of his hobbies involve intense aerobic activity. So I think you'll want to be as anxious to get out there as, as we are. Dr. Carvey also provides a website and a Twitter account to answer community questions about the uh, pandemic. And uh, I was looking at that the other day, one person on next door um, but he says it was, it was so refreshing and it was so great to get real information from someone who actually knows what he's talking about. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Anthony Covey. Thank you so much. I see a whole bunch of clapping, but I can't hear anything. So that, that's, quite, uh, that's quite exciting. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's a real privilege and honor to be able to speak to the group today, in particular because so many of you have seen me grow up. So I hope you find this information informative today. I'm going to try to share my screen here so you can follow along with these slides that I prepared. There we go. Can, uh, can you give me a thumbs up if that's displaying properly for everyone? Very good, very good, thank you. So our goal is to try to transform anxiety to action today. The website is there and you can of course follow up after with questions. You have a lot of content to, to go through and I hope you find this very educational. By way of outline, uh, I wanna discuss where we are on this curve and look at how other countries have done in comparison talk about a lot of the myths around how this virus spreads and what we can do to protect ourselves, discuss testing and what that means for us as we move forward and discuss the treatments and what's on the horizon. And then lastly, try to talk about what a return to normalcy might look like and how we might go back to work. Uh, there we go. So firstly, where are we on this curve and how are we measuring? So these are taken from the Chronicle yesterday. 
the numbers are very rough and we'll discuss those in a moment but the overall trend is that we are slowly leveling off based on the cases by day as you can see on the left and by deaths which you see on the right the different colors represent cases and deaths in the bay area and those outside in the rest of california more importantly though is i would i would like you all to take away that the most informative numbers here are going to be not the number of new cases which we hear about a lot on the news the numbers can be manipulated and massaged with statistics to make them look however reporters want but if you look at the number of hospitalized cases and the number of deaths on the right panel here you can see the number of hospitalized cases which does also show a leveling off. These numbers are more important to us because they are not subject to the same limitations to testing and how uh, widely that's been scaled up, nor to the turnaround time of those tests, which heavily limits what the information, uh, how much we can take away from the number of new cases. So hospitalizations and deaths can't really fudge numbers. And if we focus on those, we can have a, we can have a better sense of where we are in this pandemic and how California is comparing to the rest of the country here. Uh, you can see the numbers that I put here, they're uh, showing overall a trend of us doing better than the rest of the state and better than the rest of the country when you look at new cases compared to the previous week. That being said, looking at new cases, we need to remember is a very, very crude number and heavily dependent on testing. Uh, including how widely testing uh, is available and what the turnaround time is. So good news here, but they are very, very rough numbers. The take home is that the behavior interventions that we're doing in California appear to be working and we should not be complacent. Next, if you look outside of our borders and look at two countries that have done very well and not very well, Germany versus Italy, I want to just raise a little bit of attention to why there is a difference there. If we look at Germany, it's uh, notable that they've been doing very well with their viral containment. Their pandemics or their uh, pandemic started with younger individuals to start with out a group of skiers versus in Italy where the average age was much older and we know that disease progression can be more severe in elderly uh, patients, of course. Germany was quick to implement physical distancing, partly by fortune of having the hindsight of what happened in their neighboring countries. This is in contrast to Italian greetings with a uh, kiss on each cheek, uh, very far cry from the physical distancing happening now in the rest of the world. And more importantly, what I want to raise attention to is the widespread testing that Germany implemented, and more importantly, the contact tracing and the quarantine measures with that testing. Because testing on its own, as we'll discuss in a little bit, may not actually provide much benefit but if you can use that information to trace contacts and quickly quarantine people, now you can have a very powerful effect in flattening that curve. This is in contrast to Italy that has actually reduced its testing in the last month. And perhaps even more important than contact tracing is in Germany where you have trust in leadership. So when your leader tells the population the importance of sheltering in place and uh, quarantining if you've had contact, people listen. I'm not too sure if the same can be said for other countries in the world, but likely this strategy has also helped them with their containment. Moving on to the meat of this uh, pre presentation here, I want to address a lot of the common myths about how the coronavirus spreads and what we can do to protect ourselves. So one of the big misconceptions that I see all over the internet is in these tables that people try to publish saying what symptoms are more likely to be COVID-19 versus the flu versus the common cold. And I want everyone to take away here that there is no reliable set of symptoms that can distinguish COVID-19 from another respiratory illness. So a cough, whether it's productive or dry, or if you have a sore throat or runny nose, at this stage in the game with shelter in place, you are to assume that any respiratory illness is COVID-19 unless you're specifically tested negative. This has important implications for how we choose to uh, self-quarantine or shelter in place. So that's why we need to not try to play uh, laboratory test and see who may or may not have COVID-19 based on how they're feeling. How the virus is spread is also a topic of much debate and it's largely because we don't have a lot of information yet. So I want to share what we do know. There are three general ways that any virus can spread. 
And we'll discuss these in just a moment, but they're through direct contact, through droplets, and through airborne spread. And the next point is, when can you actually spread the virus through these means? So if someone is actively coughing or sneezing, then certainly that can transmit virus. But unfortunately, viruses also have an incubation period when somebody can be contagious, but not yet show symptoms. For the coronavirus, in general, it's a median five days incubation period. It can be up to 14 days. And that number informs our quarantine measures as well, which we'll discuss shortly. On the tail end of the disease, the virus can still shed after symptoms resolve. We don't yet know how infectious that viral shedding is, but the point here is that when we're talking about how the virus can spread, it's a question of how through those three general methods, and then when somebody can be spreading the virus through those methods. So as promised, we'll talk about what those methods are because there is a lot of misunderstanding about those. The first is contact spread, meaning that the virus can live on an inanimate object, and then infect you. For nearly all these viruses, infection occurs through the mucosal membranes of our face. That means our eyes, our nose, our mouth potentially. So if, uh, if you have virus on a surface and you touch your face, of course, that represents a way of spreading that virus. And hand hygiene is crucial, physical distancing, and disinfecting surfaces and clothes helps address the contact spread route of transmission. A word on gloves. Uh, many people wear gloves and that certainly may help, but it is important to remember to wash your hands before you wear your gloves and after you take them off because gloves are not a foolproof fail safe method for preventing contaminating yourself. Very common question is how long can the virus live on these surfaces that lead to contact spread? The number varies. The general trend is that it lives less uh, on copper and cardboard or for a shorter period of time than on other metals and on plastics. You may have heard reports of virus being found in cabins on the Diamond Princess for up to 17 days. The caveat here is that we do not yet know as a medical community whether that virus can actually be infectious or not. Whether it's just a bunch of viral RNA sitting around on a countertop doesn't mean it's necessarily infectious to us. So the best advice we can give is to not forget the importance of hand hygiene because we don't always have any guarantees for whether the virus will be alive or dead. The next category of spread was droplets. So these are small water particles that come out of your nose and mouth when you cough or sneeze, and they can infect us, once again, through the mucosal membranes of our face. So coughing and sneezing are where these uh, come out, and this is where part of our rule for six feet comes from. These droplets can land on our exposed skin, on our clothes, and it's important to wash those as well if we feel that we've been in contact or exposed to anyone who's sick. And then masks can help reduce the rate of droplet spread. We'll discuss masks uh, in depth in just a moment. So a big question is, when we're talking about droplets, how far can they go? Because when we say six feet, we need to recognize that six feet comes from a very rigid set of assumptions of someone who is simply breathing, not coughing or sneezing, and sitting perfectly still. So the moment that we have any wind, any humidity outside of a normal range, any coughing, sneezing, or walking or running, that radius of spread can expand dramatically. There are many studies that are trying to simulate what that spread can actually be, but certainly uh, more than 10 feet, more than 20 feet is likely. So the take home here is that six feet is likely to be adequate if you're sitting indoors and not coughing or sneezing. But the second that you change any of those assumptions, please be more mindful of the distance that you have from other people. So for example, if you're walking outside, try not to walk behind somebody who's running because they're probably going to leave a spread of either droplets or smaller particles uh, in the air for tens of feet behind them. Moving on to the last method of uh, transmission is what we call airborne spread. And these are even smaller particles that we call aerosols that can be suspended in the air for several hours. They can come out of our nose and mouth when we breathe, cough, or sneeze, and they can infect us again uh, through the mucosal membranes of the face. Uh, physical distancing can certainly help because unless there's wind, the, we don't expect these particles to move very far from where they first came out of the face and masks may be able to help, which we will also 
discussed as promised. So a lot of confusion comes around what these masks can and cannot do and using them properly. The surgical mask on the left can help reduce the spread of droplets, meaning that if someone is coughing or sneezing, the mask can have a barrier effect, however incomplete that barrier effect is, it can help prevent some of those droplets from leaving the nose and mouth and infecting people around them. So if someone is sick, then wearing a surgical mask may help reduce spread. If we don't have masks, this is where there's a role for bandanas or scarves or anything that can help cover those parts of the face that might be ejecting droplets. There is less evidence for benefit in healthy people wearing these masks. However, there is likely some benefit because you may be able to reduce the uh, burden of droplets that may land on your face if you're nearby someone else who is sick. On the right is the N95 respirator or the N95 mask. The difference between this and the surgical mask is one, they're in far more demand right now in hospitals. Um, but secondly, they can prevent against those even smaller particles, those aerosols that I mentioned. So they can actually help prevent airborne spread. The problem is that in the hospitals, we, um, we have uh, a severe shortage, as you know. And as a scientific community, we don't actually know if aerosol spread or airborne spread is an appreciable uh, transmission method in the community. In the hospital, we do procedures like placing breathing tubes and whatnot that do have a very real risk of airborne transmission. But in the community, we're not too sure. For that reason, we encourage N95 respirators to only be used by hospital staff because we actually do have a real threat of getting infected from those aerosols. So there's a lot of talk about people making their masks at home and trying to donate masks. What I encourage is if you are making masks, try to donate those to your community so that the community can donate their N95 masks to the hospitals, because the hospitals are where we believe the greater burden of these aerosol spread uh, is going to be. And importantly, whatever type of mask you're wearing, it needs to be worn properly. So unfortunately, in the community, I see uh, more often than not masks being used incorrectly. And the reason we care is not pedantic. It's because contaminated masks either won't work or may actually uh, hurt the individual wearing them. Firstly, a wet mask provides a breeding ground for all sorts of pathogens to grow in the humid, moist environment on that mask. So you don't want to use a mask if it's been wet. For example, if you've coughed or sneezed in it, you should consider replacing it as soon as you can. Secondly, touching the mask with your, for example, your face, your, your hands or your fingers, or moving the mask along your face. I see people dragging it below their chin or putting it above their head. We need to recognize that all we're doing is contaminating that warm, humid environment, that perfect breeding ground for pathogens. We're just inoculating it with our hands or with anything that's on the skin of our chin and letting things grow there. And then the moment we bring the mask back to the susceptible parts of our face, our nose and our mouth, we are uh, inviting pathogens to potentially infect us. And this, by, the, by the same logic, reusing masks or placing them on doorknobs while we're not using them, putting them on and touching the mask in that process, all of these times that we uh, interrupt the mask is a potential contamination of the mask. And the last thing we wanna do is inoculate ourselves when we're trying to protect ourselves and others. And if we do have a contaminated mask, every time we exhale out of that mask, there's a concern that we might just be blowing pathogens into the environment around us and putting others at risk. So for multiple reasons, we wanna be sure to use masks correctly, particularly when they're such a valuable resource and we don't have enough of them in the hospital. A word on sterilizing masks, the vast majority of masks are not designed to be sterilized. Doing so may compromise the integrity of the mask. And furthermore, you may just deposit to toxic chemicals inside that mask. And every time you take an inhale or you, you breathe in, you may just be exposing your body to those toxicants. So uh, we should not be sterilizing our masks. Uh, and most importantly here, as we said, contaminated masks can lead to self-inoculation and masks are absolutely not a substitute for physical distancing. As we said, you can still have droplets land on your clothes, even if you're wearing a mask. And when you go to take off your clothes at home, you can risk self-inoculating yourself that way. So absolutely not a substitute. 
Why the guidelines keep changing is uh, unfortunately confusing for many people. And to just break that down for us here is that it, most things in medicine come down to a risk benefit ratio. The benefits we discussed about masks likely reducing spread from sick people to healthy people. There's possibly a protective effect of healthy people wearing the mask because it reduces the burden of droplets that may land on their face. This is weighed against the risks, like we mentioned, the PPE shortage. If providers are getting sick in the hospital or they are reusing masks, they may risk infecting other patients in the hospital setting. And then we already discussed the incorrect use of a mask where you may self-inoculate yourself or spread it to others. So how do we determine where the risk-benefit ratio falls for masks? It depends on how prevalent the virus is, because if the, viral, the virus is so prevalent that even the small protective effect of healthy people wearing a mask is beneficial, then that tilts us in favor of the benefit. In addition, uh, how readily the virus is spread through those three different methods that I described, that determines what, whether the risk benefit falls in favor of everyone wearing a mask. And then of course, as we said earlier, the asymptomatic spread of the virus. So that incubation period at the beginning where people are contagious but don't yet know that they are sick and spreading virus. And then on the tail end, we don't yet know exactly how contagious this virus is after we've recovered, but we certainly can de detect it in samples from people who no longer have symptoms. So to summarize all of this, because of how prevalent the virus is and the risk of asymptomatic people spreading the virus, we now believe that there is overall benefit in everyone wearing a mask, even if you are healthy. This is the latest CDC recommendation because we don't want healthy people who don't yet know that they're sick to be accidentally spreading the virus. And even a surgical mask likely provides some uh, protective effect at spreading that virus to others. So a couple of images here just to remind us of what uh, people might be doing wrong. Uh, never touch the mask here. Always wash your hands before putting that mask on. You're never gonna wanna touch the mask itself, but even when you put it on and you touch those ear loops, you want to wash your hands first and not contaminate it from the get-go. Uh, a lot of face touching with the mask. I like this one here in particular. Um, keeping in mind that your phone may be one of the dirtiest objects you have, putting it up to your face mask isn't going to do you any favors. Uh, a reminder to not try to sanitize our masks here with any type of hand sanitizer. We don't want to compromise integrity and we don't want to inhale any toxic chemicals that might be distributed on the masks from trying to disinfect them. And as a reminder, never touch the mask itself. Hold the ear loops, not the mask. And uh, you should never try to put this mask anywhere else on your face, not on your eyes, not below your chin, not above your head. So it should only be covering the nose and mouth at all times. Another very common question for how this virus spreads and how we can protect ourselves are going to the grocery store. A comment I heard earlier was about hopefully not having to go to the grocery store in the first place and using delivery services. That's a fantastic idea. If it's unavailable to you, I want us to appreciate the importance of having a systematic plan to protect yourself whenever you leave the house. Because even if you have good behavior for the 99% of the time, it would be such a pity if in that 1% of the time that you left your home, that was the failure mode of your whole shelter in place. You could be you know, doing the right thing for the whole time and that one grocery store visit would uh, invalidate all the hard work you did at home. So a general plan that I recommend is to of course go at off peak or special hours if you can always bring hand sanitizer with you. Before you leave the house, make a list to minimize touching anything you're not gonna purchase. Try to always have that six foot uh, distance like we discussed. When you're at the store, try to buy nutritious foods where possible and uh, recognizing that packaged foods have lots of preservatives in them and don't necessarily help our immune function. Reusable bags are currently banned across the Bay Area, but when restrictions loosen, it's okay to use a reusable bag, though don't forget to wash it regularly. And then about leaving food outside or on the porch, don't ever leave your perishables on the porch because you don't want those to spoil and then risk infecting you. If you have non-perishable items that you don't need, you can always consider leaving them in a designated quarantine area. You can also, of course, uh, 
disinfect any other surfaces that you might want to bring into the refrigerator. It is safe to assume that any exposed surface could be a COVID-19 contaminated surface, so you want to take appropriate precautions. The most important thing is to remove as much packaging as you can before you enter the house and wash your hands after doing so. Uh, washing hands, as we said, is one of the most important steps here and never touching the face whenever we're in contact with these potentially exposed surfaces. Regarding food, it is, uh, it's good news that the virus is destroyed at cooking temperatures, anything above 60 degrees Celsius, but it's utensils that can represent a common mode of transmission because we're touching the utensils and then putting our hands close to our faces. So whenever you order in from a restaurant, always try to have a systematic plan for ordering food. For example, once you get the food, try to dispose of all packaging outside before you even bring the food in. Never shake the hands or touch the person who's uh, uh, delivering your food. I recommend uh, getting rid of all the chopsticks, forks, spoons, napkins before you come in the house and simply pour food onto your own plates and use your own utensils, then dispose of all that packaging as soon as possible and wash your hands after doing so. Having a systematic plan is the easiest way to address the anxieties that may come up when we're potentially dealing with an exposed surface. And then regarding sanitizing to help minimize the spread of the virus, there are many cleaners that we suspect are effective. Some are more toxic than others. So bleach and quaternary ammonium compounds, um, commonly seen in Lysol and other types of Clorox wipes, um, and sprays, these represent a higher toxicity, as do any sprays that release aerosols into the environment. Like we said earlier, those aerosols are very, very small particles that remain suspended in the air for a long period of time. And there are negative health effects from inhaling those aerosols and from being exposed to the very potent compounds in bleach and these quaternary ammoniums. So it's important to recognize that alcohol and hydrogen peroxide are also effective at killing coronavirus from our available data and they are less toxic in general. Vinegar is not effective. And many people ask me about the best way of washing their fruits and vegetables. Washing in vinegar is not going to help. Uh, we recommend cold tap water. Most importantly is that soap, you should never forget that detergents and soap are also very effective at uh, destroying the virus and they are very safe in general. If you ever need to use the more toxic compounds, ensure that you have open ventilation to minimize your exposure to the toxins. Pets are also very frequently asked about, and there have been reports across the world of infection in some cats, uh, dogs, uh, a tiger, as we all know. And we do not believe that pets represent anywhere near the majority reason of community spread of the virus. So it is possible that perhaps the cats in particular may be able to become infected. We don't have any documented cases of this leading to widespread human transmission though. So the reasonable precaution that I recommend is that if you are sick at home or you have someone sick in your household, try to separate the pets from the healthy and the sick because the virus could theoretically live on the fur and you don't want to accidentally mingle between healthy and, and sick and transmit virus through the fur. We should recognize that pets do provide an appreciable psychosocial support, particularly if you're in self-isolation for an extended period of time. Uh, and the easy advice is just to treat pets like humans and have them physically distanced whenever you're outside the house and if you're inside the house with healthy and sick people. Moving on to humans and how we may spread, uh, I want to just break down quarantine versus self-isolation because there's a lot of confusion around that as well. Quarantine, re uh, quarantine refers to a suspected exposure, which we define as a close contact to somebody with COVID-19. Close contact is defined as being within six feet of somebody for a prolonged period of time or being coughed or sneezed on by somebody. And uh, <clears throat> a, a second qualification there is if you've recently traveled. So if you've either had close contact or recently traveled, you need to quarantine because you may have a suspected exposure. And because the incubation period for coronaviruses can be up to two weeks, we recommend limiting your exposure to healthy people for two weeks if you suspect exposure. Self-isolation refers to someone who is infected, meaning they've tested positive or have any symptoms of a respiratory illness, or if they're awaiting a test result. 
This is different than quarantine because now you need to have a strict self-isolation where you strictly separate yourself from healthy people. That means being in a sick room, wearing a mask, where whenever you're around healthy people, such as in a car or inside the home, strictly cleaning all shared surfaces. We already discussed um, some safer disinfecting products there. So this is the difference between quarantine and self-isolation. So the next question is if you're self-isolating, how long do you have to do that? Now, this is also a, a moving target. I suspect this might change in the coming weeks, but it comes down to three days without a fever uh, and at least seven days since your symptoms have first appeared. So this is different than the 14 days of quarantine when you've had suspected exposure. If you're actually sick, you need to go into this isolation uh, precaution and the time is different. So as we move forward here, uh, testing is uh, widely discussed in the media. And I, wanna, I want you all just to take away that testing is useful for modeling purposes, but if we wanted to actually save lives practically, it means that we need to have tests with, with a short turnaround time so that we can quickly do contact tracing, quarantine the exposed individuals, and more quickly encourage people to self-isolate if they express symptoms. And this is really what Germany and South Korea and other successful countries have done well, is using testing with short turnaround times to help quarantine individuals, not just have a number that uh, floats around there. It's probably the most useful strategy in flattening the curve across the world. There are lots of home kits that we see in the media being distributed. And unfortunately, it is very true that there are counterfeit uh, kits coming from China, which is uh, very, very bothersome and, and alarming. But uh, there is no recommendation for anyone to be testing at home anyways. The hospital, the, <clears throat> the hospitals need to test kits, first of all. And second of all, these counterfeit kits um, may just give you wrong results, which is of no use to you. The next type of testing is what is called serology testing, which we're hoping is going to ramp up very quickly. Serology testing looks for the presence of antibodies to the virus in individuals to help us identify who may be immune to infection. We don't know how long people stay immune to the virus. We hope it is long lasting like other viruses. What's even more interesting is that this may provide a valuable treatment through blood transfusion, which we'll discuss shortly, where we can use the antibodies in people who have been infected, transfuse them into healthy individuals to help treat their disease by neutralizing the virus in the sick individuals. So we really hope this is going to ramp up rapidly in the coming weeks. And now for treatments. So we've all heard of hydroxychloroquine and at this point probably azithromycin and zinc. And the take home is that evidence is mounting, but it's still poor quality data. It is being studied very actively around the world because it has a good safety profile. We've uh, known how this medication, uh, we've known what its safety profile is for nearly three decades now. And it's an oral medication that can easily be taken at home. Convalescent plasma is what I was referring to earlier, which is taking a blood donation from someone who is sick, extracting their antibodies, injecting those into somebody who is sick and neutralizing the virus in them. So you take a healthy person who's recovered, use their antibodies to help cure somebody who is actively sick. There is certainly good evidence for this. However, we need to have blood donors. And as with any blood transfusion, there are safety concerns. So it's not a perfect solution, but it certainly looks very promising. And then there are more exotic treatments that we're trying to test and develop actively, antivirals and uh, monoclonal antibodies that antibodies are like band-aids to the immune system of the body. When the immune system ramps up and gets very um, activated from the virus, some of these antibodies can help calm the uh, cytokine storm, as they call it, to help the body recover more quickly. Uh, the medical consensus at this time is that the antiviral remdesivir is most likely to be the, uh, the best treatment we have moving forward. It's actually uh, was tested for Ebola Originally, we're hoping we can repurpose it for COVID-19. And now the big question that we all ask is, going back to work, what may we expect? And I try to take a three-tier approach to this, uh, this question because we certainly do not know the answer. And all of our models have so many assumptions built in that we can't take anything for more than just a, uh, a hypothesis. 
The variables, however, we can try to understand, and these variables will determine when life will start to look uh, like it did before COVID-19. So the first tier of variables is what our research will show us, and that involves the treatments that we discovered, if any of them pan out and prove to be effective, the availability, avail <clears throat> availability of a vaccine, and then for the immunity testing there, if it turns out that humans will retain immunity for an appreciable period of time, then we have uh, a very hopeful method of being able to test people for immunity. And those individuals may be able to go back to work because they're unlikely to get sick again. So they can return to work without risking the health of themselves or others. So the first level is gonna be how well can we actually develop this testing, develop treatments, a vaccine. The next tier is going to be how effective our local policies have been. So was shelter in place effective? Were people following? Were we able to increase our ICU capacity and address our PPE shortage? And then we can begin to consider whether we would, uh, if we have the available immunity testing uh, capabilities, can we begin to send people to work who have already recovered and are immune? Can we do another type of gradual phase in? A start-stop approach is highly unlikely because of the societal cost it takes to starting and stopping an economy. Then the third tier, which is unfortunately going to be the most challenging as we move forward, is the international effect of opening borders again and bringing the virus back into our community. So the take home here is that the strongest local health system is only as strong as the weakest health system. And fortunately, we'll be able to look and see how China is going to reopen their borders and see how they're able to help minimize a resurgence in cases once they open back up and tr or try to open back up. So we do have that fortune on our side. So I know that was a lot of information. I hope that did help provide some actionable information, help dispel some myths. I uh, really encourage you to ask questions and help to spread the accurate information to help combat a lot of the misinformation and myths out there. Uh, Anthony, that was, can you, get, can you hear me? Yes. Th that was great. Thank you so much. And it was, I, incredibly thorough. I mean, you hit point, point, point. Um, that was that was brilliant. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, Lynn was asking about. Oh, and by the way, if you have a question, put it in the group chat. Then we can check there. Um, Lynn was saying Italy was hit hard at the same time that the Chinese workers were coming back and forth. Um, how is that being tracked, or is it being tracked? I am not aware of that being tracked very well. What we do know for Italy being hit hard is that there are a couple of reasons why they spiked so early. One is that they had a lot of cases in their uh, ICUs in the north of Italy that uh, were elderly people that were presumed to have pneumonia. At this time now, we think it was probably actually a COVID-19 related pneumonia. So they didn't even know that they had cases already floating around in their highest risk elderly population early on. In addition, mm -hmm. as you said, they are the oldest country in the oldest continent. Mortality death. Horrible air quality in the northern part of the country, where the pandemic is worse. And they have a higher smoking rate, nearly double that of the United States. So there are many reasons why Italy uh, had a different course than other parts of the world. I hope that answers that question there. Uh, I see one here about immune. Uh, to improve our immune system. And this is also a very, very common question. And uh, I actually have a whole talk just for that, which we didn't have time for today. But there are many herbal supplements out there. Uh, in the integrative medicine approach that I take, we always try to look at um, preventive measures as much as possible. So uh, to try to be brief about this, <clears throat> we've heard of echinacea, uh, perhaps elderberry, uh, and vitamin D. These three may help prevent viral illness, but there's theoretical evidence that they may make a COVID-19 infection worse. So that's why I want to draw attention to them because these medications, we believe help increase our immune system by revving it up. The problem with COVID-19 is that we, many people suffer the significant um, consequences because of an over revved up immune system. So we want to try to avoid echinacea, elderberry and vitamin D if we show any symptoms. You can take them to help be preventive, but stop them the moment you feel any symptoms. Zinc is likely safe to take the entire time. Uh, turmeric, we believe you can add that to your food uh, or take a supplement if you wish. That there's no reason to believe that it would worsen the immune system. Um, and then the importance of sleep. 
and stress reduction in general, um, are, those are known immune system boosts. So I hope that helps answer that question. Uh, try to not take the echinacea, the elderberry, or vitamin D if you uh, have symptoms that you're starting to sense. Uh, trying to look at the rest of the questions here. Hard to find masks. What do we do about not reusing? This is a very good question. If you're using uh, a bandana or a scarf or some other cloth, you can always wash that. That's a very easy solution. And if you, uh, if you don't want to use one of those and you have a mask, the best advice is going to be to minimize ever touching the mask. We have no data to support this, but presumably if your mask is not contaminated, we don't believe there to be any reason that you cannot reuse it safely. So don't necessarily disinfect it, but when you take the mask on or off, always use the ear loops, never touch the mask itself. Don't hang it from a doorknob in between uses, try to keep it in somewhere where it's safe. Um, if you follow those methods and you never drag the mask below your chin or put it up above your head, um, you're, that's the safest way to, to reuse masks within the very real constraints we have. It's a very good question. Um, someone mentioned the virus can stay in the air for three hours. So if you walk down the street and someone walked the same route within three hours, could you catch it if you weren't wearing a mask? That's another very, very good question. It comes up very commonly. Um, a recent simulation showed that if you are running down the street, this virus can spread behind you for up to 32 feet. Uh, so six feet isn't really, as we said earlier, it, that only holds if you're still not moving, no wind, not sneezing or coughing. So the practical consideration if you're outside is to try to not be around anyone who's moving fast. If someone does run by you, try to move out of their way so you're not staggered behind them. For the three hours, it has been studied and it, those smallest particles, the aerosols, can be detected in the air for up to three hours. The big criticism is that we don't believe humans actually generate those aerosols unless you're in a hospital doing one of these procedures that like I do personally, but it doesn't happen in the community. So we don't really know how often these aerosols are generated. They can last for three hours in the air. However, if you have any wind outside, the wind is gonna disperse these, these aerosols in vectors that we can't predict because it depends on so many other factors. So there's a lot of um, incomplete data there. So our best recommendation is to treat six feet as a bare minimum and try to keep it even more wherever possible and don't go around people who are moving fast. I hope that helps uh, answer that question because it's a really good one that we just don't have more data to answer. Um, Another good question. Any respiratory, respiratory flu-like condition is automatically diagnosed as COVID-19. So as I said earlier, um, at this point when we are following shelter in place strictly in the Bay Area, any respiratory illness you should assume to be COVID-19 unless you have tested negative. Now I do recognize that not every illness is going to be COVID-19, but unless you have a negative test result, it is safest to not expose anyone in your home or in the community until you have tested negative. And that's where that um, self-isolation falls in place. You're gonna, uh, for at least seven days after the start of your symptoms and three days of being fever free without fever reducing medication, you're gonna want to self-isolate for that long. Um, a folded bandana or a folded scarf has been recommended. Oh yeah, that's great. We just talked about that. Um, another question, we stay inside. Anything received immediately goes into a decontamination room for three days. The counter is covered with towels. We immediately wash up in the sink. Is this a safe way of handling delivered things? Looks like this question was from Bert. This is a fantastic question. You're doing it very well. The um, in our preliminary studies, it looks like the coronavirus can live uh, up to a day or two on cardboard. So if you're getting a package, you can leave it in a contamination area as long as there's nothing that's perishable inside of it. You don't want anything to spoil and risk you getting sick. And then having towels on the counter is, um, is a great way of doing so, uh, of preventing it spreading onto your counters. The most important thing is to wash your hands after you touch those surfaces from the outside, which it sounds like Bert is doing. So. Uh, fantastic strategy. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, 
So a very good question. I've likely had the disease according to the Department of Public Health and an infectious disease doctor. How can I get tested for antibodies and donate? So uh, the Red Cross has a great information uh, page already on their website for getting people who have recovered to donate their blood for the reason we said, because that can be a very powerful um, treatment through that convalescent plasma therapy that I mentioned. So in, in the United States, you need to, of course, be eligible to donate blood. And on top of that, we're recommending 14 days of being symptom free before you donate blood for antibodies for other people. So the best is to just go to the Red Cross website. You can type in Red Cross um, antibody donation on Google and it should pop up there. Um, I've linked to it on my website as well. Um, these questions keep coming. Let's see. Uh, I see from the president, uh, time-wise, do we have enough time to, to keep answering or would you like to do the rest offline? Uh, well, I, th I think um, I, mean, I, I think this is fascinating. Do you guys want to want to keep the keep keep recording, keep going here? I, you know, I, I recommend just let's just keep going. We have as much time as you as you want to give us today. We Very good. Um, if we can go till hopefully nine o'clock, and then I will have to actually go on for another uh, another meeting after that. So um, yeah. let's try to knock these out. These are very good questions. Hyperbaric has been suggested as a better treatment for some than respirators because a problem has been identified with how the hemoglobin is affected. Too hard to explain here. Um, the issue with the hemoglobin, that with how the virus may affect hemoglobin, is still very poorly understood. Hyperbaric therapy has not been uh, studied extensively enough to recommend its widespread use, and it also has its own risks. For those of you who aren't familiar, hyperbaric oxygen involves going into a pressurized room with an um, elevated partial pressure of oxygen, which is used in certain very niche medical conditions, but for COVID-19 specifically, it's not been an evidence-based uh, treatment method. Uh, at this time, prevention is gonna be the most important, and um, the other treatments that I mentioned in the slide there are the most hopeful moving forward. Um, I heard that some have tested positive for COVID-19 even though no symptoms. Is this true? It is very true. And particularly in the younger population, many patients may not have any symptoms. What is most curious uh, to the medical community and to me in particular is that in um, some individuals may have no symptoms of a cough, runny nose, sore throat, but when they're doing testing, they see a positive COVID-19 test. And when they do a chest x-ray, they see pneumonia patterns in their chest, which is uh, very unusual for someone to have no other symptoms, but to actually have a brewing pneumonia, uh, an active pneumonia in their lungs. So this is, this is practically for us, because we don't want to just give information that's um, not helpful. This practically means that we need to uh, adhere to physical distancing because we don't know at this time who necessarily has the virus and who is asymptomatically shedding. So that's why even wearing a mask, if you're feeling healthy in public, may provide some benefit in reducing you launching droplets or aerosols into the environment. So it's a very good question, and we should take it very practically in treating everybody um, as kind of potential suspects for the time being. Um, trying to look at the rest of these questions. I mean, it's a little bit hard to scroll. Uh, let's see. Can, can people bring virus on shoes? Uh, it actually has been studied that virus can live on shoes. Um, so leave your shoes outside if you can. We don't actually know if that virus uh, can infect other people, but it can be detected on shoes. So absolutely try to keep your shoes outside. Uh, I have used ozone air purifier that is quite effective at destroying bacteria. Would that work to destroy, uh, I think they meant COVID-19 here in the question. Um, so air purifiers are a very, uh, very good question. There's different types of air purifiers and there are some that can actually produce ozone which may have their own um, concerns for health. Uh, so without, without knowing more about the specific product, it's difficult to say. On the average though, air purifiers probably help if nothing else circulate the air which helps disperse um, virus into 
into lower concentrations in any one given area. Um, since we're in the Bay Area and we have good weather, keeping your windows open is probably the best we can do to, uh, to, help, uh, to help spread the air around. And the corollary to this is that many people are sheltering in place for long periods of time and they're afraid to open their windows. Uh, from an overall health perspective, it's very important to always try to encourage natural ventilation because um, there's so many toxic chemicals that come off of our carpets, our furniture, uh, wood paneling, et cetera, that some people uh, confuse sheltering in place with completely isolating their homes. And from an overall physical health standpoint, particularly if we're using any cleaning solutions in the house, it's very important to keep those windows open. Using an air purifier can certainly help get rid of some of those. Um, the cheapest and most effective is going to be to open a window if you can. Um, I may have had the virus in mid-February. I suspect my use of CPAP machine was a help to my recovery. Um, that's a very good thought there. Um, we don't have any evidence to suggest that CPAPs help with the virus. CPAPs do help with sleep apnea overall and help ensure proper ventilation of the lungs, which we know can help reduce the chance of developing uh, pneumonia in general. So I'm sure that it, it helped you not feel worse. Uh, there's no recommendation that people to buy CPAP machines if they're feeling sick. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to just make sure we haven't missed any questions here. Oh, are masks effective if wearing over a beard? Very, very good question. Uh, the answer is they are universally less effective in particular, the N95 mask, which is designed to try to block the smallest particles, those aerosols, the moment you have any facial hair, it is entirely invalidated. In fact, in the hospital, if you wear an N95, you are to be entirely cleanly shaven man or woman. Hopefully it's only the men who are having to shave there, but um, it, for the surgical mask, you're having more of a bare, more, of, um, more distance between the skin and the mask, and you're reducing the effectiveness. Um, I mean, recommending everyone to go and shave. It's probably, it comes down to how exposed you think you may be to the virus, but there is a very objective decrease in effectiveness of masks, in particular the N95 with any facial hair, even a stubble. Even the, I've actually been turned down from um, N95 mask fitting for the slightest stubble because they say it invalidates the protection that it offers. Uh, Another very good question here, and it'll probably be our last one. Do you recommend sheltering in place until there is a proven vaccine, despite a general lifting that may be announced? And uh, this is a very good question to end on because it's, it's the most important one, I believe. Um, unfortunately, the answer is that it depends. For the people who have demonstrated immunity through an antibody test, they can probably return to work safely. For people who are otherwise young and healthy, they are probably going to be the first to return to work. The question becomes much more difficult for older individuals, in particular those with comorbid conditions, meaning people with diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, any lung conditions. Um, I can give the example of my grandparents or Hetty's parents who are elderly, and in particular one of them over 90 years old has type one diabetes, meaning on insulin and has had a history of heart disease and surgery. Um, it's, a, it's unfortunate, but I would not want them to lift the shelter in place until a vaccine is available. And I recognize that that might be a year away from now, but that population is at such high risk. Um, just to share numbers, COVID-19, we believe to be about a 1% to 2% mortality in countries that have done a good job. However, if you break down one to 2% across all ages, if you look at people above 70 years old, that mortality rate goes between, between 10 to 20%. So I don't want to alarm anyone with these numbers, but recognizing that 10 to 20% is a very, very, um, very real number to grapple with. So for those individuals who are elderly or who have those comorbid conditions, I think that we may need to consider a very long-term shelter in place because in the absence of a vaccine, there is no way to mitigate that 10 to 20% number of, of, um, of mortality. So I don't, once again, I don't want to be alarming, but for the young and healthy, sheltering in place will likely be lifted sooner. 
it's the elderly and the, and the sick that I think you need to very strongly, strongly consider not leaving until a vaccine is available. Uh, I hope that answers that question. It's a very good one. Nine o'clock. Well, I think that's it. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And you can always uh, contact me with more uh, questions. If there are any personal questions you didn't want to share with the group there, that's totally fine. You can uh, email me through the website there. Uh, please spread this information because like we said, the strongest health system is only as strong as the weakest health system. If we want to act and not re-import virus, we all need to work together here. So thank you for having this forum. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Amazing. Wow. Okay, okay so well, that's a wrap. How soon before we can have a copy of this to distribute to our friends? <laughs>